It's so important that we learn to move when things don't go our way, say our way. When things get hard, that we mature beyond saying, why God? That we mature into saying, who do you wanna be for me in this moment? Who am I becoming? Man, I I love school mode, don't you? This isn't a conference, it's a school. It's a very important distinction. When you're in school mode, you come fully to learn, yeah? There's an openness and a humility in the room that really pleases the heart of God. Your hunger really pleases the heart of God. You should close your eyes. Put your hand in your heart. Say, my hunger pleases the heart of God. Take a deep breath. My hunger pleases the heart of God. One of my most favorite moments in my history with the Lord was when we got done doing a a school one year. This is, we just finished our 15th school. So it's maybe like our fifth or sixth. And and I I had sat, not not this school, the school we do in North Carolina. And it had been a two month school and it was very deep. and, and, and the next morning after it's done, I was sitting with the Lord and I, I was just so grateful, you know? I was just like, God, thank you so much for coming. You just transformed these students' lives. I was so grateful. I like just couldn't, I was just crying. I was like, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, you just wanna be the one that comes back and says, God, thank you so much. And the Lord interrupted my gratitude and he said, thank you. Melissa. And I was like, no, 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 no. Thank you. And he's like, no, thank you for being obedient. It's such a profound thing when we get to a point of friendship with the Lord where there's an exchange. Amen. We know we're growing in God. I feel the gratitude of heaven in this room. You, your hunger moves the heart of God. You come to school to learn. I, I'm not here to be profound. I'm here to teach you some things. I'm a friend of God, unapologetically. I walk with him every day. He is the dearest and closest thing to my heart. I am obsessed with the Holy Spirit, completely and totally. Jesus is the most beautiful thing that ever happened to any of us, amen? And I think it's important in these moments to just soak in the the sobriety of being in the presence of so many hungry people. Isn't it wonderful? So much hunger. And I love as the school continues on, um, there's less watching and more engaging because you've come to learn. So you are watching all of it, you know. But you begin to just let God take layer after layer after layer off. It's so good. (laughs) He's so keen to take off your layers. (laughs) He's so faithful. And, and really tonight, like I, I, I just love school mode. I love it. We spend six months out of our year doing schools and for 20 to 30 year olds. And I just love it. I love pastoring. I, I just love the mode of learning, the curiosity, the wonder. I charge you to completely relinquish your judgment and your criticism. And why do they say that? Why are you doing that? You're here to be curious and learn. 
And when you stay wonder-filled, God does really dramatic things in the part of your heart that's gotten a little too old. When you get to return to that curiosity, you get to return to that childlikeness. Amen. So my desire tonight is to, is to just share things from my heart. Like I, I just love creatives. I love worshipers. And I, you know, I, I, maybe a month ago we were in Europe and I was sitting on the beach and I said, God, what do you want to do? I worship you. Like I'm, I'm open, whatever you want to speak to me, like whatever you want to do. And the Lord just said, like, just, just give them what's in your heart. Just give them what you've been sitting on for this last eight months. And I was like, great. That's pretty, that's a lot. (laughs) My desire is to not necessarily be profound, but to just share my heart. Good? I, I love the way Jesus walks with us in our lives. The most profound moments I've had with the Lord are 100% in the normal everyday parts of my life. I have encountered the the parent God as I parent my children that are not really children anymore. They're 20 and almost 17. I've experienced the overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit in the most mundane parts of my life. And I've committed myself to be a learner. I never wanna outgrow that posture. Yeah? And I love the way the Lord interrupts. He knows because of our friendship, he can interrupt any moment. And two days before the school, I was, um, I was driving somewhere that was quite a long drive, it was about an hour. And um, when, I, when I get in the car by myself, because I live in community and I lead community, I'm around people all the time. When I get in the car, I don't wanna listen to podcasts. People send me podcasts all the time. I'm like, I definitely don't want to hear people talk any more than I have to. (laughs) I don't really listen to a lot of music. I just sit really quiet. It's like my time. And so I drove all the way to this 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 appointment, did the thing, drove, and I on my way back, I uh, I felt I felt the presence of the Lord in my car really strong. And it felt like you know when you're driving with someone, like someone's in the passenger seat. and, and like you're talking, but then everything gets really quiet. And you know in your gut, they have something to say. And you know, it's like, it's gonna hurt, you know? You ever had a feeling like you've been kind of in it and then they're just, everything gets real quiet. And like, oh, they're about to say something. That's exactly how I felt. And I was like, oh, the Lord is here. Let's go, okay? I'm driving my Jeep. I have a Jeep Wrangler. It's so beautiful. I didn't know you could love a car so much until I got this car. I finally traded in my minivan that I loved. Don't hate me. I love my minivan, okay? But I got a a white Jeep Wrangler with a camel color soft top and and camel leather interior. You know what I'm talking about? I'm 42 years old. I I told John, can I get a car like this? He's like, babe, yes, you know? (laughs) Really, I got it for cool points with my, my teenagers. They're like, mom, you're just, I mean, you have, a, you have a soft top Jeep. I'm like, you're right, I do. But every time I'm in it, it's just glorious. I, every time I get in it, literally I say, wow, you made a good choice. <laughs> like almost every single day. I, I live where I work. It takes me about 30 seconds to drive to my work, and, but I still drive. <laughs> and, and almost every day I take the top down to drive 30 seconds, it's the thing. So I'm in my Jeep just for context, it's a good ride. We're in a good spot. I'm driving, I feel the presence of the Lord. And the Lord says to me, he says, Melissa, do you walk with me to get fixed? Or do you walk with me to be known? And man, I just, you know, when the holy conviction of God hits you, it's best to stay there. And I just, I just sat in it and I was like, oh, Jesus. And before I could answer, he said, 
You know, the walk is really long. And I, I felt the weight of it. It's like the walk is really, really long. I need you to settle in. And it, it just moved my heart so much. I'm like, Lord, I just, I want to know you. I want to walk with you to know you and to be known by you. I, like, I, Lord, we, can we move beyond this? Come into a meeting, fix me, Jesus, right? I want to walk with Jesus. To be known by God. I mean, what? That's the faith. That's the, the religion, the faith that we all do. To be known by God. Isn't that profound? That he wants to actually know you in all your chaos. And he desires to be known by you. And it hit my heart so deep. And I was like, Jesus, I want, I want to know you. I want to be known by you. Guys, I'm here to, this school is not gonna fix all your worship leading problems. I really wish it could for the sake of your congregations, okay? <laughs> but it can't, because you're on a journey, okay? And every moment of the journey is so valuable. And you know, you, you hear that, I, I heard that in my youth, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But man, as you get older, you're like, no, no, it's a journey, okay? Settle on in, okay? Like, you need to settle in and settle down, okay? And I, I love the presence of God that comes. And, and, and tonight, I, I lo- like what I've been sitting in this year is just the, the beautiful, I've just been crying out to the Lord, God, mature your body. Take us beyond growth into maturity. I long to, to be in environments with mature friends of God. Okay? And, and to mature it is a lifelong process. And, and you actually aren't gonna arrive and it's the worst news ever because we would love to just arrive and be done. But it's impossible. I have a, 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 a very large garden at our farm. And me and... Um, the, the, the main girl, her name's Martha, that runs the garden. We planted a eucalyptus tree so that we could have eucalyptus branches for arrangements. We have a 52-acre farm, and, and uh, we planted this beautiful eucalyptus tree, and it was thriving. It was doing great. People started cutting the branches off. It's, it's beautiful. And last summer, we were down, like, planting some stuff in the garden, and, and we both, we were walking through and we both stopped in front of the eucalyptus tree and got very quiet. And I'm like, something ain't right with that tree. And she's like, yeah, it looks really weird. And what had happened, it was, a, it was a little bit taller than me and people had cut all the branches off the whole, basically the whole tree, except where they couldn't reach. <laughs> and, and, the tr- and the shoots of the tree were going straight up, like don't touch me. Okay. Literally, they are like so tall, like shoo, straight up in it. Nothing is coming out because it's all been cut. It's going straight up. And I'm like, what is wrong with this tree? And Martha's like, I have no idea. I have to, I'll call my dad. Her, her dad's like a tree expert. These are the people in my life. They're tree experts. I don't know. And he goes, oh, you just, you cut way too much. It's too young to cut that much off. And he said, I want you to cut it in half, the whole thing, our beautiful tree. Cut it in half and don't touch it for a year. The tree is growing, it's not maturing. I said, show. (laughs) I'm like, okay. The tree is growing, it's not maturing. Mm, You better let it settle on in. We have an obsession with growth, but we don't want to mature. 
We want growth. Is growth bad? No. But it becomes very damaging if all you want to do is grow, 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 but you actually don't want to mature. Maturity is a very different thing. Don't you long for the body of Christ to be mature? If, if COVID showed us anything, it showed us some very poor rhythms we have. Yeah? And, and mature lovers of God, let, let the, the pressure system of what happened reveal what's going on. Show us, God, what's going on, right? But there is a, a very, like, again, growth is not bad, hear me. Fruit is not bad. But, but if you don't mature, okay, your roots go shallow, they don't go deep. And what happens when pressure systems hit? You topple over and you die. I, can you put up my slide of growth and maturity? Yeah, that's my handwriting. Isn't it great? This is like, I do this because this is what my, my journal actually looks like. To grow is to have increasing influence Everybody wants it in the room. You know you do. To become increasingly acceptable or attractive. Let's go. Hallelujah. To spring up and develop into maturity. To mature is based on slow and careful consideration. Having achieved a low but stable, catch it, a low but stable growth rate. We are in the culture of instant success. Give it to me fast. I want influence. I want fame. I think I have authority because I'm really gifted. Let the conviction of the Holy Ghost drop in the room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we mistake our gifting and even the anointing for maturity and authority. Okay? Maturity is a low but stable growth rate. Low and stable. Low and stable. Growing is part of maturing, guys. I'm not saying growing is bad. But when we obsess over everything that everyone sees and we have no interest in what is in the hidden place, you will run out of your gifting. You will. It is so important. I, I could talk for four hours on maturity because there are so many aspects. Every person, every speaker here could talk about how they've matured. There's so many different ways we mature. So many different perspectives of what maturity even looks like. But I'm here for the low and stable growth rate. We told the story today in one of the sessions of No Longer Slaves that Jonathan sang that chorus for three years straight in our discipleship school. Low and stable. Impact the 20, impact the 20. Until I finally said, baby, you should write that song. It's really powerful. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't get royalties. I should have said. You share them, it's true. What's yours is mine, what's mine is yours. <laughs> and and I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about a few things that I, I love, a few places that, that I am experiencing maturity that I, I like to see in the people I lead. Is that good? Because we have, guys, we have to mature. I mean, we're like, we're in a crisis of immaturity. Storms hit, everyone's like, where is God? Who is God? Why, 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 why? It's, it's like floundering, okay? We must mature. We must mature. 
The first place of maturity that I wanna talk about is living a life of generosity, okay? And I'm not talking about financially. I wanna talk about something else. You can go ahead and put up 1 Corinthians. Good. If you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Corinthians 9. I've been sitting in this, in this scripture for about a year. The Lord gave it to me in the middle of our last album process. And I had no idea what he was really talking about until we got closer to releasing it. And let, let's just read this together. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. We all know it, right? Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And then we like to just jump to God loves a cheerful giver. But there's this really profound sentence in the middle of that, okay? Each of you should give what you have decided to give, what you decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. One more time, each of you should give what you've decided to give in your, what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, hallelujah. We love to quote that one. So that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This has very little to do with money. As it is written, they freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. When I started sitting in this scripture, the Lord said, don't you love that this has nothing to do with the receiver? This has nothing to do with the person receiving and everything to do with the posture of your heart. Maturity looks like maturing in your heart, guys. This last year was so beautiful. Work, I mean, working on a new album, it was such a gift to be able to do it at our farm with our community, with alumni. We had 14 years of our schools represented in the room. It was so special. The fruit of me and Jonathan's life is not songs, it's people, okay? We've given our life for people and to sit and to stand in the room and, and look around and be like, I have history with every single person in this room. It was so profound. What we decided to do, we went into it with confidence. This is what we're doing. We're not gonna do the, the big flashy thing that we love. We're not gonna rent a theater, we're gonna do it where we walk down from our house every day and love people. We wanted to give a true story of who we actually are. And it was beautiful until we got closer to releasing it and you start questioning everything. Is it too long? Is the obvious one. We're the Helsers, it's like three songs in four hours. <laughs> Is it too long? Is it too much? And we, I would have these waves of anxiety hit me Oh, what did we do? Did we do, is it enough? Is, is, is it the right songs? Like did, did, all of it. And the Lord, the Lord said, hey, remember, each of you should give what you decided in your heart to give without compulsion or reluctancy because God loves a cheerful giver. I'm like, Lord, that has nothing to do with our album. He's like, so remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. And each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give without reluctancy or compulsion. I felt God literally delivering me from reluctancy. What did we do? What did I do? What did I do? And the Lord said, Melissa, stop questioning the offering. It, it literally aligned my anxiety very quick. That's what the correction of the Lord does. He said, stop this. And the swing, guys, from reluctancy and compulsion is very, very real. Anybody know that swing? I have to do it, I have to do it, I shouldn't do it, I shouldn't do it. I have to do it, I have to do it, I shouldn't do it, right? 
You're like standing at the, at the grocery store line and you're like, I should talk to this person about Jesus. No, I shouldn't. They probably don't even care. I should really talk to this person about Jesus. No, I shouldn't. I really, right? And you walk out and you're like, I'm not even saved. I don't love people. You know exactly what I'm talking about. For me, it's like walking through an airport. I'm like, well, I could love on that person. 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 The Lord has been hounding me. Stop the compulsion. Stop the reluctancy. Give what you decided to give. Be obedient. See, this whole thing is, hinges very much on your ability to sit with the Lord and make a plan on what you're gonna give. You know, and the Lord brought this up again when I went to holiday with my family. And he said, so, I'm like, Lord, just, you know, holidays, you know, holidays. <laughs> right? Come on, laugh, holidays. <laughs> and the Lord said, hey, Mel, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Give what you decided to give. What are you gonna give? What are you gonna offer to your family? Every moment we've come to in the last eight months, whether it be ministry, friendship, the Lord asked me, hey, what are you gonna give? Decide what you're gonna give. Let's decide together so that we don't do this nonsense of reluctancy and compulsion. Because remember, I am able to bless you abundantly. It's hit every part of my life, my marriage, my children. When we released our album and all of the fear and anxiety of releasing your most precious things to the world to say, I like it, I don't like it. Why is that song 23 minutes? <laughs> right? And in that moment, that morning before we released I'm Your Beloved, and I just said, Lord, I'm here with a cheerful heart. I'm gonna give the offering that we decided to give with no reluctancy, no questioning, no doubt. They scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Guys, I'm, I, if you are obsessed with the receiver, with the posture of the, why, the way people receive your gifts, <laughs> you are going to burn out very, very fast. You cannot give yourself Okay, it's one thing to get feedback and all that I'll talk about in a second. It's another thing to become obsessed with the receiver. They scattered, they freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness, your righteousness, your right relationship with God endured forever. When you live a life of generosity, generous of time, presence. I feel the Lord uh, um, invite me to give more in presence than anything else in my life? Will you be present? Will you give five minutes? We, we've reduced this to money and I think it has very little to do with it. Obviously, be a generous giver, but you have so many things to give, right? So many things to give. Your words are so powerful. Can we stop compulsively giving our words? Compulsively giving it, social media, all of it. It's, a, it's a like compuls, compulsion reluctancy. If I have to see one more thing that someone posts and then immediately takes down, I'm like, now you gotta stop doing that. <laughs> you need to mature. And guys, this life of generosity is not an obligation, it's an invitation. There's an invitation to live a life of generosity. As worship leaders, we have to be postured as generous givers that don't get caught in this ping of reluctancy and compulsion. Reluctancy and compulsion. It's so important that you learn to obey. I cannot reduce my obedience to the Lord to how someone else receives what I'm giving. I have to stand before the Lord. 
Because see, the Lord said, I love your new songs before anyone ever heard them. And the Lord said, let's give it, let's give it all. Let's not cut them down. Because that's not who you are. So when you're able to stand in that place, like it's, oh, this is what I received from God. Then I can stand in the place and all the different opinions, they come and it doesn't, I, scat, I freely scattered our gifts. My right relationship with God endures forever. It doesn't matter the receiving. Y'all good? <laughs> You're so quiet. I wanna talk about an, another part of maturity. It's so important that we learn to move when things don't go our way, say our way. When things get hard, that we mature beyond saying, why God? That we mature into saying, who do you wanna be for me in this moment? Who am I becoming? We have to mature beyond the why God. Why, 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 right? I love that my kid, Cadence Zion is 20 years old. If he was still asking the why question like he did when he was six, that drove me literally insane. Why do you do that? Why do you have to do that? Why do you do that? Why, 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 right? Now he knows me. He's more mature. He trusts me. He doesn't ask those questions like that anymore. We must move, write it down. I must move beyond why God to who do you wanna be for me in this moment? James 1, two through four. We all love this scripture, don't we? Except we don't at all, right? Consider it pure joy. We're like, yes, Lord. In our heart, we're like, why God? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, say many. many. Anybody had the many kinds? Okay. Because you know, say I know, that the testing of my faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. Say finish. It's work. Okay, we want to bail way before perseverance finishes its work. Can I say, can I get a raise? Yeah, you want to bail? I want to bail. I'm like, are we done here? <laughs> Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What? That is a massive promise, guys. That is a promise you should cling. That is a cornerstone for the human experience that is full of suffering and sorrow, tragedy, pressure. You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. What I love, what I'm learning to love actually is pressure moments. I spoke about pressure last year and the Lord's teaching me a lot about pressure. And he has been. And you know, when the Lord's like, let's talk about pressure, you're like, God, no, not more pressure. <laughs> Seriously? How long is this gonna last? A year, two years, six months? We did, we've done so much work in the last three years. I mean, for me having a chronic illness, there's always an element of pressure that I'm having to work through with the Lord. But it's intensified in the last couple of years and it's been really hard. And I have to keep coming back to like, God, I want the pure joy. Not the denial, not the like, my life is falling apart, but God is good. I want the true, beautiful joy that is strength. Not this denial nonsense, okay? Stop doing that. It doesn't help you, it doesn't help the people around you, and it certainly doesn't help your relationship with Jesus. He loves your honesty. We have this moment, I'm gonna tell a little story. Everybody good? Yeah. We had this moment, we just, we just did a, a whole week of ministry in Europe. And um, 
we, we, had, we did some beautiful stuff. And we were in England for a couple of days and then we, we flew to Ireland. We got like a 5.30 call time and, and got on a plane with our band, flew to Ireland, um, checked in our hotel, and then we went to the arena to do our, our sound check. It was supposed to be at five o'clock. Worship started at seven. We were doing an event with Casting Crowns and Matt Redman. It was sweet, really sweet. And so we're waiting and, and, and sound checks getting pushed. And you're like, we're good. It's getting pushed, it's getting pushed, it's getting pushed. And we're, you know, you're starting to sweat a little. Because it's not like 100 people, it's like 4,000. And we're like, it's no big deal, stay in the pocket. This is, <laughs> me and Johnny are like, we're like, stay in the pocket. You get, you stay in the pocket. And it's getting pushed and we finally get on the stage and it's, a, it's just a mess. Like the, li- the, the, the line system isn't even set up. The piano isn't even plugged in. Um, the, the, the poor production guys, like they had all these brand new boards they had no idea how to use. There was no microphone from the, the, the monitor guy to us. So he couldn't, we had to have literally a friend run back and forth and be like, the bass player needs more of Mel's voice. <laughs> Johnny needs more electric guitar. <laughs> okay, meanwhile, the clock is ticking, 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 right? And we're like, whoo, we're starting to stretch a little. That's what, you know, like when I start, you know, <laughs> stay in the pocket. <laughs> we're looking around and it's like, it's like not getting better, guys. They can't get the piano to work. Mo- Sweet Molly, she's like, you know, she's like plugging stuff in. And, and we're like, can you just please hold the doors, hold the doors. Like we can't, we have to open the doors. So it's like, oh God, like maybe uh, 20 to seven o'clock, like 6.40, 4,000 people ascend into the arena. <laughs> They're so happy to worship the Irish. <laughs> they were pumped. It's a lot of Irish energy. And we can't, we don't even have our voices in our in-ears. These are the things we all have nightmares about. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Had that nightmare where you like, you get up to the worship and like, there's no string during guitar. You're not wearing pants, right? <laughs> None of the band knows your songs. We're talking disaster of epic proportion, okay? And, and we're looking at, I mean, guys, it's like, I can't, really describe <laughs> how tense it was. <laughs> and, and, and we had a, like another modern guy just had to step in this port. He, just, he didn't know how to use a brand new board. And, and the guy's like, I just have to take over. Like you have to step aside. And he's just trying to get stuff in. And we like, okay, we should just run something really fast. You know, like we run like literally one um, verse of Raise the Hallelujah, and they all think we're starting. Of course, we're not starting. We can't even hear our voices, right? And we're like, dun, 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 dun. And they're like, whoa! We're like, oh, God. We're all, <laughs> at this point, me and Jonathan are turned, we're like, we're just facing the band, like, but this is what happened, right? We're looking, I'm looking at the band, and we're just like, everyone is so centered. Like, I'm looking at, I'm looking at Molly, she's super centered. I'm looking at Luke, I'm looking at Jake, I'm looking at Cassie, I'm looking at David. Me and Jonathan were like, Stay in the pocket, <laughs> right? I mean, like, these are the things people dream about doing until you're there, and it's a nightmare, okay? <laughs> and, and we just have to get off the stage. I mean, we have to, we have to get off. We barely, barely have it, even just the, the instruments in our ears. We walk off the stage, and, and this sweet production, production guys come up, and they're like, we gotta change your batteries. The batteries were too small for the packs. I mean, who, who ever heard of a thing? They don't work. The packs aren't working. <laughs> They're like, we have to start. We have to start. And you know, Jonathan turns around. He's like, listen, I cannot go on the stage without a pack. And she's like, okay. <gasps> you know? <laughs> and we're like, stay in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, and we, and we huddle up. I mean, you gotta, you gotta huddle. Okay, in these moments, you gotta huddle up. We huddle up, 
And we're looking at, we're looking at the band and we're just like, we're all like, what is happening? Could it get worse? No. It didn't, thank God. <laughs> the kindness of God. And we just, we're all like, guys, just stay, like, there are 4,000 stories in that arena. Every single person came to encounter the presence of Jesus. We have to stay in the pocket. Everyone's locked in. We're all just like, we're gonna go and give our whole heart. Like, this is what we're doing. We went out. I mean, it, like we literally, I mean, our, our, Luke, our violinist, just took his ears out. He literally had, he, he didn't even have a violin in his ear. He just popped him out. We do revivals in the air with the Irish. It was epic. And he's just like, kind of just going for it. I'm like, well, I hope it's in the right time signature. <laughs> and we poured our heart out. It was so beautiful. Not necessarily what happened with the receivers, but we got off the stage and we, and we, and we did another huddle up, okay? And, and I was so proud of my team. I was so proud of me and Jonathan. Like we stayed with Jesus, okay? It was so beautiful. And we went on to, to do uh, several more events that were all kind of crazy. They all had, it was like mounting situations over the whole week. We did six worships, six worship nights in six days. And we, we got to the end and it was, it was beautiful and really hard. And me and Johnny and the kids, we stayed in England for a bit. And I, when I got quiet with the Lord, it's like, Lord, what was this week about? My gosh, like that was crazy, Right? And the Lord said to me, he goes, Melissa, how are you gonna know how much you've grown until it's all tested? And I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, how are you gonna know how much work you've done and how beautiful it is until the pressure valve is turned up? You'll never know unless it's tested. And I, I sat up a little straighter. I'm like, okay. And he's like, I'm so proud of you. And I was like, okay, we're growing, we're maturing. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't lose my peace over my ego in the stage. And I didn't give up the inheritance of 4,000 people encountering Jesus because it was uncomfortable for me. Guys, we, listen, we, we, my bass player's here. I'm like, she know, we sat, we got off the stage and we were like, we just passed a test. I never want to take this again. But it was so beautiful. How else are you going to know? How else are you going to know until you face Trials of many kinds, okay? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work. Maturity equals moving from why God to God, who do you wanna be in this moment? And who am I becoming? You guys good? You feel the anxiety of that moment? You're all like, whew, that's a lot. I'm like, yeah, it was, you're right. <laughs> but we passed it. We passed the test. Me and Jonathan normally would be like, Hurrah! right? Because you like, you, you like attack the person you know will forgive you when you get in bed at night. <laughs> right? That's the person you go after. Come on now. Come on now. You get a little sharp, a little edgy with the person you know is going to forgive you. You don't do it to people that you're not sure about. <laughs> we stayed in so much peace. I was so proud. I felt the pleasure of God. Now I'm so proud of you. You stayed in the pocket with me. It didn't, it wasn't like denial. It wasn't like, oh, it's gonna be fine. God is good. We can't hear ourselves. Who cares? It was actually very intense. But God is in the intense, guys. 
And when you run from it, you don't let it finish its work and you will never mature. Okay? Okay, I'm gonna end with this. That went so fast. Now I'm sweating. I'm sweating because I'm reliving the moment. (laughs) Oh my God, Lord, never, please, God, never. (laughs) Woo! You're like, I'd love to be in Belfast Lane for 4,000 people, but not like that. The last thing I wanna, I wanna say is mature lovers of God always stay open to the correction of the Lord. You will never outgrow your need for the discipline of God. I have found that to be very true. A couple of years ago, I had um, a very profound dream I had a season in 2018, 2019 where I started dreaming a lot. And it was very, very meaningful to me. And I had this dream that I was standing in the middle of this orchard. And if you've ever heard any of my teachings, like orchards are a big deal for me. Like in my 20s when I was very, very sick, the Lord started speaking to me about the orchard of my life and planting orchards and being faithful to the orchard. And so in my, in my early 40s, I, I had this dream. And, and I, was, I was standing in this orchard and they were, all the trees were in bloom. And it, but it felt more like a vineyard. I mean, it was like rolling hills as far as the eye could see. It was just covered in these beautiful um, like apple trees in bloom. And I was just taking it in in the dream. And then I turned around and Jesus was standing next to me. I've only had two dreams where the Lord actually came. And I was like, oh, it's you. And he just smiled, it's me. And I was like, oh my God, you're in, like, you're in my dream. Like, you know, when you can, subco- I just love that we can think about that kind of stuff. And, and he said, Melissa, this is the fruit of your life. <laughs> he said, I want you to walk with me. And we started walking through these, these orchards. It was very, very meaningful. And he was just talking to me about the fruit of my life. I wish I could remember everything he said, but it was so, it was just so beautiful. And after we walked for a very, very long time, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this black presence moving through the orchard, like through the ground. And it was withering all the trees. And I said, Lord, what is that? And he looked at me and goes, oh, it's negativity. And I was like, Lord, what do I do? It's gonna wither my whole orchard. And he goes, oh, you just repent. It was like, <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> He's like, oh, you just repent. And I was like, Lord, forgive me for every place that's tucked in my heart of negativity, self-hatred, all of it. Judgment, criticism, all of it. Started repenting. And, the, and, and the, the black presence literally stopped and started retracting. And all my trees reappeared. And I woke up. And I want to say, guys, I had that dream like 25 years into walking with the Lord. It's really important that you understand that you don't outgrow the correction of God. Mature sons and daughters never outgrow the discipline and the correction of God. And when we learn to receive it with our whole hearts, we don't go into that weird shame response, right? Like, why is this happening? Did I not do enough? Because the Lord is saying, oh, it's just that. Just repent. Mature lovers of God never move beyond the discipline and the correction of the Lord. I want to read Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 
You have it? Hebrews 12, five through six. My child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God. Or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, it proves that you are his delightful child. My child, do not underestimate. I love that word. Do not underestimate the value of the discipline and the training of the Lord. Or get depressed when he has to correct you for the Lord's training of your life is the evidence, right? It's the evidence, guys. It's the proof that he really loves you. To get this, it's the proof that he really loves you. When he draws you to himself, it proves that you are his delightful child. Mature sons and daughters do not push away the discipline and the training of God. I'm so grateful that the Lord in a dream showed me the beauty of my life and then also showed a place where the enemy literally wanted to take out my whole orchard. When you live with a chronic illness, negativity is very hard to overcome. It's gnawing at you every day. You will never be well. It will never be enough. You will always feel like this, right? It's been part of the the growth of my life is to push back negativity. And I love that Jesus came and he said, I'm gonna love, I wanna show you all of this, but this is real. No condemnation. Guys, when you really, if you know the nature of God, you will not question his motives. At the beginning of the year, the Lord, the Lord said to me, he goes, hey, I'm coming to your garden with my pruning shears. I saw him like in his pocket. He's like, how do you feel about that? And, I, and you know, the younger Melissa would have been like, what did I do wrong? Why do you need to prune it? But the 42-year-old Melissa knows that a good gardener prunes for fruitfulness and maturity. Mature sons and daughters say, bring it on. What do you want to take out? Bring it on. Let's go, Lord. And I want to end tonight. I... You know, this, this week, you're learning so much. You're, you're like, you're taking in so much. Well done. You're so soft. I love the, the stunning age range here. My God, you're just hungry. I'm just so moved by it, honestly. From the young to the old. I'm so, God is so moved by your hunger. And we, just for us to understand, we just never stop maturing. And I believe that the Lord, in this week, he's giving you keys. He's also come to prune. He has. Because you you can't mature without pruning. I did a whole study on on pruning. I'm very deep into it. Do you know a fig tree takes 10 years to produce fruit? 10 years. But if it's tended to properly and pruned properly, it can produce fruit for over 200 years. We're not just talking about you. (laughs) We're talking about the legacy of you. It's not just your fruit. It's the fruit of your life when you're not here anymore. It's the lasting fruit. The patience to let God prune. Oftentimes, when you do a heavy prune, you have to wait a year for fruit. When you understand the rhythms of God, you don't question these things. You don't go into a shame storm. Why, why, why? You trust the Lord. You trust the timing of the Lord. You trust the seasons of God. And I I just want to end tonight by just giving the Lord permission. Is that good? 
Because God is, he, He's so, no matter what age you are, you're still maturing. I feel like I'm learning more in my 40s than I ever even imagined I would in my 20s. Because I'm more hungry. And I don't wanna just make it. I don't want to survive, I want to thrive. But to thrive, you have to trust the master's hand. And he has come to prune every single one of you. For your good. Yeah, let's open our hands and close our eyes. Lord, we long to mature. Father, right now we ask for forgiveness, for craving growth and not craving maturity. God, it's this Culture is confusing. It feels like success is maturity, but that's not the way the kingdom works. So we offer you the places where we want quick growth and don't want to sit in the maturing process. Father, we see you walking up to our garden, our orchards, and You're full of loving kindness. You're so clear. And you haven't come to condemn or shame us. You've actually come because you you desire our fruitfulness for the long haul. So we say, God, we give you space. We're sorry for all the times you've come with your pruning shears and we've said, You can't come in this garden. We're sorry for the places we've pushed your hand away. And we open the gate, God. We let you in to the deepest places of who we are. We let you in, God, to our relationships, our churches, our teams, our children, our marriages, our grandchildren. We let you into every part of our life. And we say, God, we don't wanna just bear fruit for ourselves. We want, a, we want a legacy of fruit. Father, we're asking that you would give us generous hearts. That you would help us mature beyond compulsion and reluctancy. God, we're asking for the pure joy that understands the point of testing and pressure. Lord, we give you permission. Just say, I give you permission. We give you permission this week. God, we give you permission in all the in-between moments. We say, have your way, Lord. More than anything, we want to be close to you. And we know that you haven't just come to fix us. You've, you've come, you wanna know us. You wanna be in the soil of our lives. You want us to know you. We long to know you, God. We long to know you, God. We give you permission. Help us grow and mature in trust. I feel like the Lord is really restoring a lot of your trust tonight. Where you feel like the Lord has broken trust, actually life has broken trust. God has not broken your trust. And he's restoring the places where you're, you're trying to trust, but you can't. God, we ask for that right now, for the oil of your kindness to pour out on every place of disappointment, every place where we, we, we start literally shaking when you come to prune because we feel like we're trying so hard. Lord, we relinquish performance for you. We want friendship. 
we want to be known as friends of God. We want to be known as friends of God. I bless you for the long haul. I bless you, I bless you, I bless you for the long haul. For the long haul of what friendship requires. We receive the courage and the strength, God. We receive the courage and the strength for the long haul. Let's take a deep breath. Lord, we love you. Just take one more deep breath. Very good. Amen. Amen.